Hi. Uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Stefan. I'm going to tell you about um, some work I did with some uh, excellent colleagues at, at, uh, at Google and Harvard on, this is, this is on, uh, we've seen uh, I have some examples of PDs already today, but just uh, sort of how to, uh, different ways to solve PDs. Sort of tr uh, hopefully sol solving PDs where you have known equations and, and trying to solve them in, uh, in, uh, in better ways. Um, so I guess this audience probably doesn't need much uh, introduction, but PDEs are really a, like a really big class of equations in physics and engineering. Lots of different problems. Really, anything where you're doing continuous dynamics, you're solving you're solving a PDE. Um, and the uh, and, and the interesting thing about PDEs is that again, like lots of ca cases in uh, in in, uh, in physics, really simple equations, really sol really hard to solve in practice, um, uh, and generally can't be solved analytically. So of course we use uh, computers, and to solve uh, to solve PDEs on uh, on computers, we represent them on grids of various different types, um, and unfortunately. Uh, we often can't represent all the physics we want um, because uh, just to make them uh, practical to solve, we have to solve things on pretty coarse grids, even, even when we're running simulations on supercomputers. Um, so this is an example from uh, roughly the resolution of a state-of-the-art uh, weather forecast model, which are probably which are great. They, I mean, they give great forecasts, very useful. Um, they still blur out a lot of all the high-resolution detail in this, in the, like in this, in this hurricane. Um, which means that they can't represent um, they, they can't represent the convection, the sort of physics in clouds properly at all, basically. Um, so we'd love to be able to solve things on on, on on finer grids, but of course that makes your simulation much uh, much slower. Uh, so our, our hope is to sort of use machine learning to give us better ways to solve things, uh, sort of solve things on coarser grids with sort of the accuracy of of, of higher resolution grids. Um, and in particular, our hope is that we can do this by looking at the at repeated patterns in simulations. Um, because simulations are full of sort of different, different repeated patterns we can see by eye. Um, and these are, uh, so even though we see all these patterns, these are most numerical methods, they, they don't really make use of these patterns. Um, they sort of treat everything as sort of in, in, a very, in a very abstract way as sort of smooth curves. Um, so can we do better in terms of how we, how we solve equations by using patterns? Um, and part of the inspiration here is coming from uh, techniques in uh, machine learning, a problem called uh, super resolution. And so here the idea is that you take a, uh, say, like a, a very coarse image. Um, we want to reconstruct the high resolution detail. Um, the sort of the standard way, maybe until, I guess, maybe, say, if you ask, like, I don't know, maybe uh, 10 years ago, we said something like a, uh, like a bicubic interpolation, just, uh, which gives you something that's really blurry. You sort of lose all the detail. Um, now, if you use something like uh, like neural nets, we've seen that you can actually reconstruct an image that gets that, that looks much looks much better. Reconstructs a lot a lot of the uh, it looks like a face now. Uh, of course, it's not not it's not perfect. Um, it sort of messes up some of the, some of the high resolution detail. It kind of dreams up something a little different, um, but it's definitely a lot better, and, and certainly it's a much more plausible model. Um, so the hope is that we can do something like this for uh, for uh, for PDEs. Now this. But basically, today, the, uh, sort of our numerical methods are basically in this bicubic interpolation sort of regime. Basically, assuming everything's a smooth curve, not, uh, and they're not based, they, uh, they can't reconstruct this high, this high, these sort of the high fidelity data because they, they don't, um, because our methods don't, uh, haven't seen any examples. Um, okay, so let's see, some, I'll work, walk through a simple example. So here are some, uh, some example curves. These are from, uh, from, a, uh, from a PDE called uh, Berger's Equation that I think was mentioned earlier. Um, in terms of solving this equation, you pick a grid. Um, so let's say we'll pick, some, uh, we'll pick some uniformly spaced points. And now the challenge is pretend you, you didn't, we, we don't know what the curve is. Now we have to essentially reconstruct that curve so we can estimate derivatives, apply the equation, go to the, go to the next time step. Um, and the challenge is that if you just draw like a polynomial curve line through these, these points, you get something that has these all these extra, um, like these extra oscillations, it's a smooth curve. If we didn't know what the equations were, this would be plausible. But we know um, we're solving Berger's equation. We know, the, we know the equation that we're looking at. We can run it a bunch of times at high resolution and make a library of solutions. They look like, like these things with these characteristic shock waves. Um, so if we go back to this and we, uh, we, we plug the, that data into a machine learning model, we can come with interpolations that actually that look look much better than the polynomials, um, almost almost perfect in this case. 
Um, so that's kind of kind of the idea. We want to like look at a, a, a big big libraries of sort of pre-computed solutions, uh, sort of at, at high resolution, try to make a, a coarser grained uh, model that can sort of capture capture that um, uh, that that does a better job than polynomials. Uh, and so the appeal here is this is uh, say another another PDE for fluid motion. Um, the appeal is that is if we, we want to, these coarse representations in principle again can be a lot faster because you have this it's like a fourth power in terms of the um, uh, in terms of the number of states you need to deal with if you're uh, assuming that your algorithm is, is the same. So this is sort of the the principle we're aiming for. Where in most applications we'd actually be okay with the coarse grained image as long as the physics. Is, 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 is roughly accurate. The challenge, of course, you actually do this with, with sort of standard methods, and you, they sort of they go wrong in, also in a few different typical ways. One, is, one way they go wrong is they, they kind of they sort of blow up and give totally non-physical results um, if the representation is, is, is sort of inadequate, um, so they're, sort of, they're unstable. Um, or you can kind of like blur out the high, the high resolution features that can't be well presented, and then you get something that's just not very accurate. It's like it's too blurry. Um, so this is kind of the, the standard conundrum uh, for coarse graining, at least with, uh, with these. And so we want to see if we can do better with machine learning. Um, and the way we want to do that is plugging into estimating these spatial derivatives. This is kind of the key approximation for solving PDEs, lots of different numerical methods in terms of, say, like say low order methods, different higher, higher methods. Um, the, the, they're all about uh, how do you approximate the spatial derivatives. So this is the part we want to, we want to approximate. We want to keep the physics we already know, but plug in machine learning. Um, and sort of the way we're going to do that is with, with deep learning. And that's because deep learning is sort of a <coughs> is, is a part of sort of broader class that uh, of uh, a sort of program te a technique people call sort of refer to as like differentiable programming. People are really excited about machine learning these days. It's the idea that you can write your computer program in a differentiable way, so you can optimize the sort of much broader space of computer programs based uh, to data instead of just the few algorithms you pick out by hand. Um, so we're going to, and this is, and we can train this in sort of generic way with deep learning frameworks um, uh, to sort of make tunable programs. So now we're going to, so, and this gives us sort of the best of both worlds from sort of the machine learning side and the physics side. So we can use, it's not like deep learning is inherently better than decision trees, but it's, it's something that you can plug into these, uh, that you can use in a very generic way. Um, and we can do things like, we can easily put in things like constraints. Uh, by, by building in, uh, building on top of standard uh, numerical methods, uh, things like uh, like conservation laws, for example, like con this is a, a continuity equation. So we can we can build that in using use a finite volume technique. Um, so our, our algorithms are going to look a lot, very basically exactly like uh, sort of the standard numerical methods for solving these sorts of equations, except we're going to plug in uh, we're going to plug in a few. We're going to turn some of those components into learned components. So we're going to optimize some of the parameters in these in, in the existing algorithms. Uh, again, using say very very small neural nets, just a few layers, um, and we're going to put and we're going to train these by comparing to sort of highly uh, to sort of fully resolved simulations on a very a very small grid. Um, and we're going to put loss on on the sort of on the discrepancy of the solution after uh, after after uh, one or a handful of time steps. So that's the, that's the the general idea. I'll show you an example. See if this works. Okay. Uh, well, hopefully the movie works. If it doesn't work, then we'll, oh, there we go. Um, OK, so this is an example solving Burr's equation. You get these, these shock waves that move back and forth. Um, and the, the green dots are our neural net. The orange dots are a baseline here, which gives basically is completely uh, giving completely garbage. Just, um, uh, so this is just one example of doing this. We can do this, look at this more systematically. And we see that we can, with our neural net methods, we can get accurate results on much on much coarser grids. Here it's about, I mean, roughly comparable accuracy to these low order polynomial methods at about, about eight times coarser grids. Um, and uh, so we, we can do better than the sort of the simple, uh, like the, the, the simple methods based on polynomials. We can also do better than uh, some really sophisticated methods. Here, we know is a technique that was specifically devised for capturing shock waves. Um, and it has a lot of heuristics that are built into it to capture, to represent shock waves well. And we actually, we actually do better than that technique. Um, and the other interesting thing is that we don't necessarily need to go all the way to the neural net. We can also do much simpler models, like just learning, say, just learning like the uh, constant term. So these are learning linear coefficients. In this case, that would be about, like, about 10 parameters. Um, and so we, so we sort of learn like have an optimal 
uh, an optimal set of fine difference coefficients, we can also, um, uh, we can do almost as well as, say, as these Wino techniques um, at <coughs> actually sort of significantly less uh, computational expense. Um, just, again, just based on optimizing uh, our methods to the data. Um, okay, so the, 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 the hope is that we, you can take these techniques, you, you run a, some high fidelity simulations um, on a very small grid, and then we're going, and then we're going to want to extrapolate to much bigger problems. Um, uh, so where, where it's very expensive to collect, to, uh, collect that training data. Um, so this is like just one really simple example. We tried, we, so we've, we tried sort of extrapolating to sort of, uh, uh, to larger problems with our, uh, with Berger's equation where we trained on a, on a very small grid. We run inference on a, on a much larger grid that's, that it has, that has a, a pretty uh, similar set of boundary conditions. Um, and, uh, and again, our models give, give pretty reasonable results. I don't, haven't shown the, the ground truth here, but uh, it's, uh, it's very close. If you can look at our paper for the <laughs> uh, uh, to see the comparison, um, it, it basically works. Um, and the other interesting thing we can do with this is that we can, uh, is that uh, because we built in the structure of the standard numerical methods, we can look at the predictions of the, of the neural net, and we can interpret them. So we can look at these, at these say, the, these learned finite difference coefficients, and you can see things like the coefficients tend to be pointed sort of preferentially in a certain direction, which is anti-correlated with, the, uh, with the, 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 uh, the velocity field here. Um, and this anti-correlation basically means that the model is learning to look in the, the upwind direction, which is a, uh, a, very, uh, a very common uh, trick used in um, numerical methods for, for solving fluid dynamics. Um, so it sort of rediscovered some sort of physical knowledge. Um, so we did this across uh, sort of a suite of different uh, 1D PDEs that are different, different toy versions of fluid, fluid dynamics. Um, so the, the Berger's equation with shocks, uh, the Kurt-Rigg uh, de Vries has uh, solitons, Kermode has these, um, ha is, has uh, sort of chaotic dynamics like, flav like, um, like, uh, like a flame. Um, and again, across these sort of suite of equations, we see the neural net is sort of consistently get letting us get sort of uh, comparable accuracy at uh, at uh, significant, uh, significantly coarser grids. Um, okay, so we're starting, we've been starting to, to try to try to scale this up towards sort of more interesting problems, like uh, in sort of higher dimensions. So uh, we have some sort of early results with, again, solving uh, like infection equations. Um, and here we see, uh, we're, we're, we appear to be doing significantly better. Um, so this is, again, very early results, but roughly here we're doing about, sort of comparable accuracy in about four times uh, coarser grids to a um, uh, <coughs> uh, to, 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 our, to our baseline method. Okay, so uh, in, uh, in, in sort of in summary, um, we used machine learning to build uh, PDE solvers that are better, at least in, <laughs> in some ways. Um, uh <laughs> so there's, it's not it's not entirely practical yet, right? But um, it's 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 getting there. Um, <laughs> So the, the sort of the key ingredients are the, so we have these we, we incorporate these physical constraints and that lets, that gives us some aspect of both uh, sort of interpretability and uh, in generalization we can get we guarantee things like like uh, like conservation of mass exactly um, we can beat some of these sort of hand tuned methods that have been optimized over I guess by by people over many you know over over decades um, they're not necessarily a lot uh, faster yet, and that's because neural nets are pretty expensive um, to run compared to a lot of sort of standard discretization methods. Um, but uh, there's sort of reason to think that it's, especially when you scale up to say like high performance computing, that like it's, it's advantageous to do more compute and sort of less, less communication. Um, so we think that it's, it actually will, uh, in that regard, it'll actually, um, it, 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 it may actually be pretty practical. Um, all right, and uh, this is one, okay, my one toy example is generalization here. We didn't, we didn't train on the Google logo, um, <laughs> but it still swirls uh, uh, pretty well. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, and with that, uh, thanks for your uh, attention.